not able to join us, welcome back, folks. So I uh, am eagerly looking forward to grading your first assignment. But just in case you were bored and looking for things to do, I wanted to point out that you do have something to work on. Uh, the second formative assessment is due Monday. That is available under quizzes and icon. And I just checked the questions this morning and you should be able to answer all of them. So just as a reminder, formative assessments are not graded, but I do look them over to make sure that you gave a good faith effort and to read your answers to see um, if there's any points of confusion or clarification that I need to make for the group. So the idea is to give you some structured review. Um, I also looked at the schedule and I pushed back the beginning of the next unit because we're a little bit behind relative to where I had thought we would be, which means that I also had to push back homework two. So just in week seven here, homework two was originally due on the 5th of October. It's been pushed back three days to be the 8th of October. And that day on the 8th, that Thursday, is I'm actually going to be in a conference. And I got the hours of the conference and realized that it's not going to overlap with office hours. So there won't be class that day, but I will be able to do office hours. So if there's any last minute questions on homework, you can pop in and work on those. And um, by the way, office hours are for anybody. So like if you want to come to office hours and just sort of sit in the background and work on homework and then pop in, you know, to my attention if you have questions with things and then pop back out as you work on it, like that's fine. Um, that's the way it worked last semester and it seems to work that way in Zoom too. So anyone is welcome to come and stop by and hang out as need be. So those are some things you can be working on, um, as well as uh, homework three is due two weeks after that on the 19th, and that's the one using real data. So if you're still having issues finding data, please let me know. I think everybody has gotten some by now and um, eager to see what you've come up with. So any questions on logistics schedule, any of that stuff? Okay, just keep in mind when I change due dates, um, they will always be the, the, the correct version on this website. I don't update the paper version of the syllabus um, very often, only when I add readings. And so this is going to be the, the schedule that I update and follow. So I'll send out emails too after class to let you know what the new due dates are. But just Monday is formative assessment and then homework to push back three days. All right. So last time we were talking about M plus, right? And the fun of typing code. So, so this unit is all about confirmatory factor analysis, which is latent trait measurement models that are designed for continuous and normally distributed responses. And reviewing ways of identifying the model, which is what we're going to be focusing on to start with here. Um, this slide, slide 21, inside lecture 4, shows you all the combinations of ways that you can give your latent factor a scale. So each latent factor in your model needs to have a, hang on, I'm hearing something in the background. Okay, there it is. Um, each latent factor in your model needs to have a mean and a variance. So you have two choices for how you give your latent factor a mean and two choices for how you give it a variance. The choices are organized here on slide 21. So the one that I'm going to recommend that you use because it's the easiest to interpret what the factor then means is this top left quadrant where we set the metric of the factor. We give it a mean of zero as indicated by the stupid triangle thing in the picture and we set the factor variance to one. That way, we can estimate all of the factor loadings. So factor loadings correspond with factor variance in terms of identification. If the factor variance is 1, then you can estimate all the loadings, the slopes. The factor mean being set to 0 means that you can estimate all of the item intercepts. So each of those then has a scale as well. Okay. Questions on any of this so far? All right. So we looked at an example last time where we had set the metric of the factor this way. I'm going to show you some of the other quadrants, um, the one to the right here and then the one down below as the other possibilities that you may see. Um, this on the right here, as noted by the yellow sign, this is the M plus default. What it does for you, and the same is true in Levon, 
if you don't otherwise indicate is that it tries to fix the first item's factor loading to be 1 for identification, which means the factor variance can then be estimated. On the mean side, the factor mean is still fixed to 0, which means all of the intercepts can be estimated. So that's the one that I wanted to show you next. So each of these four quadrants is equally acceptable to do. These are all different ways of giving your latent variable a scale. It doesn't matter which one you pick in most cases. The only situation in which it's going to matter is if you're in a situation where the factor is going to become an outcome of something else. So later on in the course, when we start estimating relationships of one factor predicting another, any factor that is downstream, that is an outcome, has to have its variance be estimable because it's going to become leftover variance once it's predicted by something else and that number needs to be free to be able to absorb the impact of that prediction. So it's the only situation in which it matters. Otherwise, if you picked item number two as the anchor so that it has a loading of one, doesn't matter. The other parameters are all going to rearrange themselves around that common anchor point. And uh, last week, I sang happy birthday to you to illustrate this idea of anchoring. Do you remember this? Okay, I'm not going to sing for you again, but I have another analogy for those of you who don't uh, play instruments or sing. The idea of changing the key of the song, whenever you have the distances between the notes that remain the same, it's just the place where you're sort of anchored to is different. Um, it's just like logic problems where it's something like, you know, Bob is three years older than Chris, and twice the difference between Chris and Sally's age is two, right? To solve that kind of problem, you just need to know how old one of them is, and then you can work the logic of the relationships between them to figure out everyone else. Model identification and factor analysis is exactly the same principle. You just have to nail down one point, and then all of the other estimates are going to realign themselves around that as your anchor. So the scale is arbitrary. It has to be because we're talking about imaginary variables as the model predictors here. So let's take a look at how we would tell our software to do those various things. So this is where we were last time. This is example four, and I am on page two. This was the model that we went over in class that has the z-score factored method of identification where the factor mean is zero, the factor variance is one, and so we are estimating all of the loadings for the six items that are supposed to be our observed measures of the latent factor of forgiveness of situations. We are also estimating all six intercepts that's a default. You don't have to write that. It happens automatically. And we're also estimating all six error variances for the items. And just to recall, the error variances is the part of the item's variability that is due to something else besides the factor, thus the dinosaur reference, not the factor. You can call it error. You can call it unique variance. You can call it specific variance. I don't care what you call it. It's just not the factor. We don't know what it is. It's all in one pile. And to set the metric of the factor, when we list the factor by itself, that is referring to its variance. In this case, since it's a predictor, we're setting that variability to 1. And we set the factor's mean to 0 by putting it in brackets. So any questions on the code that we just reviewed we talked about last time? OK. And so here's the results that we went through. The first set of estimates are going to be your factor loadings. And this is the unstandardized solution. So everything is in terms of the scale of the original outcome variables. The scale of the factor is mean 0 variance 1, because that's what we set it up to be. So it looks like item 1 and item 3 are relatively stronger because their loadings are relatively higher, but we can't say that for sure because these are scale dependent and items one and three may have differential variability. So we'll need to look at the standardized solution to compare across items to judge the uh, quality of their factor loadings, the strength of their factor loadings. 
The mean of situation as a factor is fixed to zero, and that's why these 999s are here, because this is not an estimated parameter. The intercepts for the items in this case, because the factor mean is zero, the intercepts are the item means. So this is just a recreation of the data. Variance of the factor was one, again fixed, so that's not something we need to test. And then this is the amount of variability that's left over in each of the items. So then we have a couple of equations in here just to demonstrate how the model predicts the total variability of any item. So for instance, the measurement model for item one, according to our results, would look like this. We have item one is equal to its intercept, its item-specific intercept, which was estimated at 4.5 and some change, plus the factor loading, which is a slope. So for every one unit increase in the factor, where one unit corresponds to a standard deviation in our current scaling, for every one unit increase, the expected item response goes up by 1.2. And then we have some error left over whose variability we can put into this formula down here, which expresses how the model predicts the total variability of any item. It's part factor, part error. The part that's factor is a function of the factor variance as well as that item's loading squared as a weight. So that way, the more of the, the item that is related to the factor, the higher the variability contribution from the factor through the loading. So if you had an item that was terrible and its slope was zero, then none of the variability would be due to the factor variance because the weight in front of it would result in a null contribution, a no contribution of the factor. Covariances between items is something else the model predicts, and it does so via the factor loadings for the two items that you're predicting the covariance for, also as a function of the factor variance. And so in this case, the model says that the covariance between items one and two, for instance, given their factor loadings, should be 0.866, but in reality, it's actually only 0.577, so we're off a little bit. And where we're hopefully gonna end up today is in talking about ways of judging that offness as model fit. Standardized solution we looked at, so this translates all of those estimates into a correlation scale so that the total variability of each of my items is one and the total variance of the factor is one also. So the difference between these scalings unstandardized means that we're working with the original units of the outcome variables even though the factor is standardized. A fully standardized solution standardizes the outcomes as well. Variance one means zero. So now these factor loadings here, those are correlations. And we can readily judge which items are better than others. It looks like one and three are the highest loading items. They have the strongest correlation with the trait. And if we take each of those standardized loadings in a correlation R estimate and we square them, we get to the R squares down here. So it's telling you the same thing just in a squared metric. And I had a good question after class that I wanted to clarify the difference in how we're thinking about these R squares versus how you would think about them in a regression model. So do you remember regression with like real predictors? Remember that? Once upon a time when we actually had X like in our data set? The R square was always a measure of how much the model was able to explain. So like if I have an item score, my model is supposed to predict why some people give higher answers than others, right? The predictor values are supposed to be reasons for that variability, and then R squared measures how much of the variability is due to known reasons, predictors in the model, versus unknown reasons still remaining. This kind of R square is not really like that, because this R square refers to the contribution of the factor. So why is it that somebody might answer item one with a higher number than someone else? Well, this result tells me that 50% of the reason why somebody might answer higher than someone else is because of the factor. So item one is 50% factor, 50% something else. But why is it that someone answers higher than someone else? I don't yet know, because I don't know why someone has a higher factor score than someone else. 
So I'm not really explaining it in the way that you're used to thinking of in regression because we still don't know what causes the factor score variability. The way that I would characterize these R squares is that the variance that is attributable to the factor. It's not really explained in the same way. It's just a partitioning of how much of the variability is due to the signal of the trait relative to the noise of the error. But we still don't know why some people have different trait scores than someone else. We will get there. That's the whole point of the structural model is to then treat the factors as variables to be explained by other things. So why do you think someone might be more forgiving than someone else? Uh, well, maybe because they're more religious. Maybe they're older. Maybe they are more conscientious. Maybe they're more extroverted. I don't know, right? There's all these reasons that would explain why the trait of forgiveness varies from person to person, but the variability in the trait then trickles down to the items. So we're not at the explaining part of the program yet. Um, can we explain the difference between the two tables that we are showing again? It, the standardized versus unstandardized solution, is that what the question is about? Or is it the slopes versus, no, the ones below it? Uh, these two? Yes, okay. These two are the inverse of each other. Not like one over, but like opposite. I need to be more careful in my math phrasing. So uh, residual variance in the standardized solution gives you the amount of the item's variability that is due to not the factor as a proportion, whereas the R square gives you the amount of the item's variability that is due to the factor as a proportion. So if you know one, you know the other. One minus R square is residual variance. And R square is just the square of the standardized loadings. So really the story is standardized loading. If you know the standardized loading, you know the R square, and therefore you know the proportion of variability in an item that's due to factor, and therefore you know how much is left over to be error. So standardized loadings are the story. So across all of these different methods of identification of the factor, of giving it a scale, all of them will result in the exact same standardized solution. It has to. Because once you remove any differences in scale, this is what's left. Um, can we talk about how this relates to discrimination? Yeah, these are indices of discrimination. The concept of item discrimination is how related an item is to the trait. How strongly changes in a trait level would trickle down to changes in an item response. So these are standardized loadings. Can anyone guess what the highest these numbers can be? And this is one where you can do the gestures. Yeah, one, a perfect correlation. That would mean that an item is all factor, no error. Could you have a negative standardized loading? Could that happen? It could happen mathematically. If it happens to you, that is not good, right? That means as your trait goes up, your item goes down. It's related the wrong way. So in these models, I would highly recommend that any items that are scored backwards conceptually be reverse coded so that all items are consistent in what more means. I have seen instances in which combinations of negative and positive loadings mixed together um, cause the model um, to not converge. And it has to do with this idea that we don't have a true scale, right? You have to basically set which, which end is up. Otherwise, if you have some items that are positive and some items that are negative, an equally valid solution would reverse the two and it would change the direction of what your trait means. So by setting it up so that more means more, all of the loading should then be positive. Question, so if an item has a lower factor loading, 
It doesn't mean that we should not use it. Is it good because we want to capture people at the lower severity of the trait? Yes. So the strict definition of CFA would say that item intercepts down here are irrelevant. The strict definition of CFA is that there is a linear relationship between the factor and the item response. And so if you have an item that is strong, it has a high factor loading, then it's a good item and it stays equally good the more because there's an, a one unit change at every point along that. In practice though, that can't be true because these are bounded items. In this case, it's a one to seven scale. And on almost every scale you're gonna encounter, there is an end point. There are two end points. So there is some point at which the factor loading has to asymptote out and not be helpful anymore, which means you should probably pay attention to the intercepts. So we kind of ignore that problem in CFA because we believe in this idea of a linear relationship, but it's not actually true. So yes, in practice, I would say it behooves you to pay attention to the intercepts as well as the slopes. And for ordinal data where we're headed, um, we will pay attention to both for sure. Okay, questions, thoughts, comments. So the standardized solution is where it's at. But just to show you, how it doesn't really matter how you identify things. So here's uh, how the model predicts the correlations between items instead of the covariances, <laughs> homework question. The standardized solution picks, predicts item correlations. The unstandardized solution predicts item covariances, two different things. Let's see another scaling of the same model using the M plus default. So instead of fixing the factor variance to one, I am going to fix one of the item loadings to one instead, which means the factor variance becomes an estimated parameter. So this is what happens by default in M plus and Levon and a bunch of other programs. So the first item here, the at one sign, make this a little bit bigger, means I am fixing its loading to one and the loadings of all the other items get to be whatever they want. All of the item intercepts are still estimated because I am still fixing the traits mean to zero. So trait mean goes with item intercepts. Trait variance goes with item loadings. If I fix one of the loadings to one, that means I free the factor variance. But if I keep the mean fixed to zero, then I still have to estimate all six of the intercepts here. So what's gonna happen is that the amount of variance in the factor is gonna be borrowed from the amount of variance in item one that's the good part. So here's what ends up happening for our results. So here's the unstandardized loadings. The first loading is fixed to one. And I don't need to see your input if I see this, these output tables that I'm gonna ask for in your homework because if I see a standard error of zero, I know that it's fixed. So if you're not sure what you did, you can always check your output and see what happened. So because this first loading is fixed to one, that's now my reference point for the model. And look at what happened to the other loadings. We saw from the previous solution that items one and three were relatively highest and the others were lower. Still the case. Previously, it was like 1.2 for those and then the others were in the 0.8s. Now we're just down a little bit, but it's all relative to that new definition of what one means. So the other item loadings are relative to that. The variance of the factor is given down here. It was estimated as 1.523. Do you wanna know where the hell that number came from? That seems pretty arbitrary, right? My factor variance is 1.5. Where did that come from? 
I can tell you. Item 1. In the previous solution, we found that item 1 had a total variability of 3. And we found that of that item's variance, half of it was due to the factor. So in item 1, it's 50% due to the factor, 50% due to the error. Item 1 has a variance of about 3. So the good part that's due to the factor, the 50%, translates into about 1.5. And that's why the variance of my factor is that 1.5. So putting it together, when you fix a unstandardized factor loading to 1 for identification, you are not saying it's perfect. That is not what it means. What you are saying is, hey, can you take all of the variance due to that item that's the good part and call that the factor variance? Just borrow that number. So now the variance of the factor is 1.5 because that represents the amount of variability in item 1 that's attributable to the factor. Now how might I screw this up is to do both. If I forgot to estimate the variance of the factor, if I kept it fixed to 1, and I fix the loading to 1 also, what would I be saying? Can you guess? If I fix the loading to 1 and I fix the factor variance to 1 also, Let's take a vote. Cool, thumbs up, or not cool, thumbs down. Few, few people voting. Yeah, not, not cool. Not cool, no. Because if I have a factor variance of 1 and a factor loading of 1, then what I'm saying is that item 1 is perfect. It's all factor, no error. So not only have I identified the model, I have constrained the model beyond that. Two ones is not good. You need one one. Either the factor variance is one, or one of the item loadings is one, not both. What would happen if I forgot and I didn't set any of them to one? Can you guess? M plus would vomit all over the place. It would run for like three minutes and say, yeah, I have no idea, your model's not identified. So yeah, if you, uh, if you s tried to estimate all the loadings and the factor variance at the same time, you will have an unidentified model because the factor doesn't have a scale then. The factor variance has to be identified either as a known number or in relation to how much of the variability of an item is the good part. The latter happens when you fix that item's loading to 1. If I had, if I had picked a different item, if I had decided to set item 2 to be the marker, could I do that? Sure. Would it make the model better or worse? Nope. It just changes the reference. If item 2 had a loading of 1, then I would bet the item, the loading for item 1 would go up to like 1.5 or something to compensate. So you're just changing what the definition of 1 is. Um, I say this because I have had students in doing their projects for this class, like systematically go through and compare the fit of the model, changing each item in their scale to be the marker with the 1. I've had people do this before and it's like three extra pages of their life that they're never getting back because it doesn't matter. It doesn't change anything. There is only one way that it could change something and that is in the unlikely event that you pick an item as the marker that is unrelated. So if you have an item that is not correlated at all 
it has no factor variance to pass up to the factor. And since you can't have a variance of zero, the whole thing blows up. So as long as your items are at least partially related, it doesn't matter which one you pick. You may see um, guidelines written that say things like you should pick your best item to be the factor loading of one. No! Yeah, that face. T, I like your face there. She's like, no! That is correct. It doesn't matter. Everything will realign itself around the key of one, right? It will be fine. So long as, ever, as, as your item is related, it will be fine. Um, when you look at a correlation matrix before this, how much correlation needs to be there to still be in the game? Any. Any. I would say um, anything, like I've seen this work with correlations of 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Like it, it, will, it will solve the model with, with at least some signal. Now whether or not you have a factor, like whether you believe in your factor at that point is a different question. But yeah, mathematically it will work as long as there is some correlation there. Um, another question, when we have, when we mean the item needs partial correlation, do you mean the correlation between the items? Uh, yes, your items need to have at least some correlation between them in order for you to have a factor. The correlation with the factor has to be something greater than zero for a loading of one to be an acceptable marker for identification. It's pretty hard to do. I've taught this class like, I want to say eight or nine times, and I've only seen one person with an item that wasn't related enough to make it the marker to make it blow up. It's only happened one time that I've seen in, in several hundred students. So I find it unlikely, but it can happen. So yeah, if if your items are related, then you will end up with an item that is related to the factor. There's not a distinction that you can make based on a correlation matrix. Um, another way of saying it is that what you're doing in this process is taking that ball of correlation across your items and giving it a name. Let me put it that way. Like it's, you are renaming the covariance across your items as a trait. Like that's what it is. So if you have covariance there, you have something to name. If you don't have covariance, you have nothing to name, and there's no point to doing any of this. Okay. Keep the questions coming. I like that. Did I get all the questions? I think I'm up to date on the chat window, but let me know if I missed one. Or in live. You guys can talk, too. You know that, right? It's not an interruption. I want you guys to talk to me, otherwise I would have an asynchronous class where I just talk to my computer. Right? I want to talk to you guys because it's so much more fun that way. Plus my computer doesn't like it when I sing. It just it doesn't give me any kind of reaction whatsoever. All right. I'm not going to sing today, I promise. Enough enough for one semester. Uh, one more just to show you what happens on the uh, the mean side. If you change the method of factor identification so that the factor has an estimated mean instead of fixing it to zero, then that means that one of the item intercepts has to be fixed to zero instead. This is, I would say, rarely if ever done, but I wanted to show you what happens. So for instance, if we fixed item one's intercept to zero as a way of identifying the model so that we could estimate the factor mean, then item 1's intercept goes to 0, and what its mean used to be is now the factor mean. And the rest of the item intercepts go haywire because they are relative to a factor mean of 0, or a factor score of 0, whereas the mean of the factor is all the way up at 4.5. So it's sort of weird and unintuitive, and that's why people don't do that. Why would you do that? Uh, there is only, there are a few situations in which you would want to do something like that, and almost all of them involve a what is known as a growth curve model, which is where you're looking at how a factor score changes over time when it's measured at least partially by the same items, and 
oftentimes in that case you want the factor to capture the metric of the variables itself so you push the means up to the factor um, for that reason that's the only situation which I think it would be helpful do I teach that method um, I wish I could actually I don't have room so all of my degrees of freedom and courses I talk about it a little bit in longitudinal but I don't have um, a lot of focus on it but I have stuff if you're interested in those things um, factor analysis is one way that longitudinal modeling is taught I tend not to start that way because of the overhead of all of this stuff which makes it a lot harder to teach longitudinal models I start from regression instead okay I think that's that's all I wanted to say about that other questions okay yes you can look at changes in a trait over time but before you're able to look at changes in a trait over time you have to know how to build a trait which is what we're doing this semester and if you want to know how to do the over time part using observed variables then that's next semester so next semester I'm teaching longitudinal again I hope to see at least some of you there to come party with me I wrote the book did you know that I wrote a textbook it took me five years just so that I could teach from it in my class it's very exciting to me anywho so is this model any good do you see anything in here yet that points towards evidence that I am right when I say no these six items measure one latent trait of forgiveness of situations do I know that yet not really I have no idea based on just these numbers right here how well the loadings have recreated the relationships among these items I don't know that yet I did just one example item one with item two the standardized loadings are supposed to recreate the correlations between items so it should be a function of the two item loadings plus the variance of the factor which is one in a standardized solution so for instance the model predicts that item 1 and 2 are correlated 0.36 but I know in the data they're only correlated 0.24 so I don't know yet if this is a good model but this is not a good sign that I've already whiffed on one of them so yeah we gotta test the model that's what's coming up next but before you know how what the test results mean I think it is potentially useful to know where the numbers come from because it's related so that's what I wanted to pick up is back in lecture four to talk a little bit about estimation Woo! said no one ever just a little bit so I um, if I were in class live I'll probably get in trouble with the YouTube people if I try to pull it up never mind um, if I were in class live with you guys this would be the point at which I would go to the YouTube and play the theme song for maximum likelihood for you did you know that maximum likelihood has a theme song it does uh, it is authored by a rapper called ski circa 1993 94 somewhere in there and it is the song I wish I were a little bit taller so you can look for it I'll, I'll put it in the chat window if I get a chance but uh, that's maximum likelihoods theme song so the pandemic is pre preventing me from playing that for you okay Kelly remembers that song thank you I'm not the only one who's never heard it okay I said I wasn't gonna sing today but I didn't say I wasn't gonna rap I wish I was a little bit taller I wish I was a baller I wish I had a girl who looked good I would call her just a little bit of that thank you yeah that's my best ski low imitation but that's all that's all that estimation is it's making things taller so it's all complicated and scary but if you can just hang on to that idea of tall that's what it's about and maximum likelihood is just looking for what makes the data the tallest the only catch is in how we're defining height so let me pick up with that on slide 31 here in lecture 4 we'll talk about height and making things taller so you've heard of the idea of a black box before right like when you don't know what's happening under the hood it's like oh that's a black box 
Um, when you run M+, I don't know if you've seen this yet, literally a black box pops up when you run M+, and then the results pop up. It's showing a DOS window, for those of you who know what that is. And so I find that very ironic, that when you think about the black box of estimation, that M+, literally has one. But yeah, the big picture here, we tell it, do this, and in a few seconds, the answers pop up. So here's a little more detail in how that process works. So in this example that I was started with, I had two factors, each measured by three items. So let's say that I wanted to fit that model because, spoiler alert, that's when I'm going to end up doing to my forgiveness of situation items, three of which are measured in a positive way, three of which are measured in a negative way, this type of model is what's going to be necessary. So let's say that I have that set up. And in terms of the model parameters that I have to have it find for me, things that I need estimates for, I need six intercepts because I need one for each item. I need six factor loadings because I need one for each item. And in this case, I am saying that each item measures only one of the two factors. So I don't have any cross loadings as they are called when an item is measuring more than one factor. We have what's known as simple structure. Each item goes with one factor at a time. I also have six error variances, one per item. So intercepts and error variances are always one per item. It's loadings that you can potentially have more than one per item if you believe an item is measuring more than one factor. But in this case, each item measures one factor, so there's one loading per item. And we also have the factor covariance to estimate if I have two factors in the model. What I don't have are any factor means or variances because in order to estimate all the intercepts and loadings, I had to fix the factor means to zero and I had to fix the factor variances to one. So those are not part of the story. So that gives me 19 total parameters that the estimation procedure has to find. So the item parameters are being treated as fixed effects, meaning that for each item I am going to get an intercept estimate with a standard error. I'm going to get a, an estimate of this error variance with a standard error and, and each of the factor loadings. What about the factor scores? It turns out they are not model parameters. So even though we express the CFA model as a linear regression type equation where I've got an F in it, they're not actually model parameters. I don't need to know what F is for each person. What I need to know is the distribution of the Fs. And I am going into this process by saying it's multivariate normal. And I have means of zero, variances of one, and a covariance that I got to find. Another way of saying this is that the factor scores are random effects. They're not part of the model. I don't need them. I can ask for predictions of them after the fact, but they're not things to get found. So this process is going to result in three things. The estimates themselves, standard errors of the estimate that give us some index of the precision of with which the numbers, uh, would, precision around the numbers, the believability of the numbers, and also as a byproduct of the estimation process and why I'm talking about it right now is model fit. Model fit is how we know whether we're right. I am saying these six items are measuring, in this case, two factors. We were looking at one factor before. I could say that my items are measuring three factors, whatever. Model fit is how we know we're right. And all of this is going to happen in this unit due to the magic of the multivariate normal distribution. So let's start with univariate normal first and just revisit that. So do you remember this picture? I stole this picture from Wikipedia so long ago, I don't know where it came from. But uh, it's a normal distribution. And here's the part that at least I was never taught along with these pictures. Here's the formula that creates those normal distributions. That thing is scary looking, huh? I don't, I don't have this memorized. You can take away my quant cred. I'm, not, I'm, a, I'm a big poser. I don't have this memorized yet. But what I do know is that for each case, if I plug in what the mean is predicted to be for that case based on my model, and I plug in what the variance is, out pops a number. 
out pops a number on the left-hand side of this equation that is this y-axis here. That's the part that I want to emphasize. For any value of your variable, this function gives you the height given the parameter values that you're talking about. So if I have a current guess as to what the mean is and a current guess as to what the variance is, so for instance, separating these red and blue lines as differences in variance, I can know for any case what the height is. And the goal of this analysis is to make all of my cases as high as possible, jointly. That's the idea of maximum likelihood. So when you only have one outcome, you have a curve that looks like this in two-dimensional space. But how many outcomes do we have? You can do hands. More than one, right? I've got six. So I need this in like six dimensions at once. Six dimensional height. I can't draw that. But I got a formula for it. Uh, question, what is the difference between ML and MLM? Um, depends on the context. Maximum likelihood is ML. MLM is one of the estimation options for ML. Yeah, so um, estimators versus estimation. M, maximum likelihood estimation has different flavors, so to speak. ML is, the, is like the general term. Um, there's MLR, MLM, and other things that stand for variance of maximum likelihood. We're, just, we're not into the variance yet. This is just straight up maximum likelihood. So this univariate formula that gave me the height up here, the multivariate version of it that gives me six heights simultaneously for all my data looks like this. So we swap out residual variance for this thing here, that's sigma. Sigma is what the model says the variances and covariances across my six outcomes are supposed to be. So that's what's created by my factor loadings, by my factor variances, by my factor covariances. And the means are recreated by the item intercepts. And the item residual variances, the error variances, fill in whatever holes the factor variances don't get. So my factor model gives me that thing. And I can calculate the height given all of my model parameters. So that formula that we looked at a little while ago for how sigma gets created, it's a function of the loadings. It's a function of the factor variances and covariances, and it's a function of the item intercept or item variances. The item intercepts then pop in to give me the item means. And so this formula is used to give me a height. It's a height in dimensional space corresponding to the number of outcomes that are contributing to my height. And so what I can end up doing is rearranging that formula into something that is a little bit simpler. Uh, this is the formula that is being used by M plus, for instance. This is likelihood, height. And here's the natural log version, which is what we work with because it's easier. So what ends up happening is that they, the program creates what's known as start values. So what's my first guess for what my loading is going to be? I don't know. Let's try one for each of the loadings. Let's try 0 for each of the intercepts. Let's try 0.5 for each of the error variances, whatever, right? And it goes through, and given those parameters, comes up with a predicted covariance matrix. I plug that into this formula, and for each person, I get a height. How tall would my data be if these were my model parameters? And I get it across all the people. And I can add those heights together if we're talking about log height. I'd have to multiply them together if we're talking about just plain log likelihood. OK, now I've got a number. How do I know if that number is any good? Well, let's try some more values. OK, so instead of choosing 1 for all the loadings, let's try 1.1. Now let's recompute the height. Did it get higher? If it did, I'm heading in the right direction. And it goes through this process of trying new values, getting a height for all the people, 
and using it uses calculus to try and scale sort of the tracking of the height. So you're, if you think about all the possible heights that these values could give you, it starts to form like a mountain. And you can figure out where you are on the mountain by looking at a slope. So there's a lot more complicated stuff about this than what I want to say or have time to say. But basically, calculus helps you helps the, it determine whether or not you're heading up or you're down the other side. And it helps the process be refined more efficiently to figure out which set of values you try next. So this trying on different values, outputting a height, try on new values, output a height continues until the total heights across everybody in your sample don't really change much. Like you're trying new values and it's not helping. You're kind of like at the top of the mountain. And then it says, I'm done. And it spits out the numbers at you. And that number, the final version of everybody's height, that is your log likelihood for the model. It's height. And more is better. You want it to be as tall as possible. So this type of iterative process and result of height allows you to do two things. It allows you to figure out what is the best possible version of each parameter that results in the highest combined height across all my people. And it allows you to put forth a separate model, see how tall it gets, and use the difference in the heights as an indicator of which model is more likely to be right. So it all boils down to height. Once you hit that magical point where the heights don't change very much as you try new values, it spits it out and calls it done. Another thing that's going to be spit out is the, sec is the standard errors. And these are a byproduct of this process of finding the heights. So each parameter in the model is going to have its own mountain, so to speak. And the steepness of those mountains is an index of how sure we are that that's a good estimate for the parameter. Like it's the steeper it is, like the heights increase really quickly as the values of the parameter increase on the x-axis, and the flatter it is, the less certain we are what the value should be. Uh, the inverse of that process then forms your standard errors. So standard errors are inversely related to steepness. Steeper mountains means smaller standard errors. We're more sure that that's what the value it should be. So it's like, my loading is 1.1. Is it like, it's 1.1? Like, the heights really didn't change if I tried 1.1, 1.2, 1.3? Or is it 1.1? I know it because if I try something else, the heights go re down really fast. So the standard errors pop out as part of this process as an indicator of, of model quality. And you will see this concept of information show up in the context of IRT models as well. That's related to the same idea. The amount of information that your items have to give you is inversely related to their standard errors. Higher standard errors means that your items have less information in them. So then we've got our answer, meaning that we have figured out through trial and error which set of model parameters makes our combined data the tallest. So for each person, we have a six dimensional height. We add up all those six dimensional heights together, we get the log likelihood for the sample. We figured out a way to make that thing the tallest. So it's tallest relative to all the other values that we tried, but we still don't know if it's any good. We need a benchmark. And in the case of CFA, because we are relying on this multidimensional, um, multi, excuse me, multivariate, that's the word I wanted, normal distribution as the mechanism for height, we've got an answer key for what the right answer for height is. We know how tall our data could be because we know what the covariance matrix right answer is. It's the one that's in the data. We know the right answer for what the covariances should be between the items. We know the right answer for what the item's variances are, and we know what the right answer for what the item means are. So that thing is going to be denoted as S inside these formulas. Sigma is our predicted version of S. So we're going to compare 
the height that we got from our model where our loadings are predicting the item covariances to the height of the saturated model, meaning we just let the covariances be whatever they want from the data. That's the right answer, and that's as tall as it can possibly be. We're going to compare those two things. And in the case of complete data, that boils down to a handy-dandy formula where you can look at the differences between the heights as um, corrected for sample size, and you get a chi-square statistic that pops out of this process. Um, you'll see this formula given. This is also a complete data idea that describes uh, this fitting function in terms of how far off. But the main idea is that what we have is the data height. So if we don't try to predict anything, if we just let the data be what they want to be, how tall are all of our cases going to be? And now how tall are they under what we say the data should look like when we put our factor loadings in that predict those covariances instead? and the mismatch between the two becomes model fit. All right, I know that's a lot of stuff. Height. Height is the, height is the answer. So we're going to end up with two numbers that we're going to pay attention to on our output. One is the height of our model. So as given the way that we've set up the parameters, which loadings we've chosen, which item intercepts and error variances we've chosen, right? That's what's the height of what we said the data should look like. And it's the highest it can be given what we said. We're going to compare that height to the right answer height. The highest the data can be, which is just if we let the data be whatever they want. We don't predict anything. We just say, okay, the right answer is the data. So what I'm calling the saturated model is the data. In other classes with me, you will hear as the unstructured matrix. That sound familiar? Anybody? Maybe? MLM people? It also showed up in uh, generalized last semester. Yeah, so the idea of unstructured, the idea of saturated, those words mean the same type of thing. It's the reference point for height is just let the data be whatever they want. And then how close to that can we come with our model? We can't ever be better, but we can be not worse. So this whole process is an exercise in not worse. That's how we know if we're right. If I can say my factor model creates predicted covariances that are not worse than the ones in the data. Like the fit, the difference in height is not worse, meaning the covariances match. I said that badly. Let's scrape that from the record. Differences in height. If I can approximate the data, then I don't have any differences in height. So we are computing height. The formula that we're using for height is based on the multivariate normal distribution. So when people say that CFA assumes things, this is why. We assume that factors are normally distributed. We assume that items are normally distributed. And we assume that people are independent because that's the formula we're using for height. So question, is maximizing height the same as minimizing error? Absolutely it is. So in the process of, say, ordinary least squares regression, when you learn that the answers for what the slopes and stuff should be are the ones that minimize the squared errors. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, that's this. It works out that the answers that make the data the tallest are the same answers that make the errors the smallest. I sound like Dr. Seuss. I'll say that again. I like that. It turns out that the answers for what the parameters should be that make the data the tallest make the errors the smallest. But in this case, what errors is referring to is discrepancy between what the real item covariances are and what the model says they should be. So don't think error in the sense of prediction, think discrepancy.
offness from a predicted matrix. That's what we're focusing on. So what happens if any of these assumptions are violated? What happens if the items aren't multivariate normal? Well, then using a metric for height that's based on a multivariate normal distribution is not going to give you a great estimate of height. What do we do instead? Well, it turns out there's other distributions. Um, we're going to end up with something that approximates a multinomial distribution instead, a conditional version um, that's going to be more appropriate for the formula for height in the case of IRT and IFA models. Uh, likewise, what if people are not independent? We're assuming people are independent, which means we can add all their heights together in the log height formula. If they're not independent, well, we need a model that has a way of combining responses that are dependent. Can you think of any models that I may have talked about that would work if responses are dependent, are related to each other? Like my favorite thing in the world to teach about? Besides this, of course. Multi-level models or mixed effects models, yeah. You're secretly learning multi-level modeling right now. I am indoctrinating you guys into my world because items are nested in people. <laughs> but if items are nested in, say, students and students are nested in schools, then the trait scores from students from the same school are going to be related, right? That violates my height formula. Okay, so rather than thinking about a multivariate height for just one student, what I actually need is a multivariate height for the whole school. And then I have the height of the school under whatever pattern of association my model says they should have, and I add my schools together instead. So we change the formula for height. If any of these assumptions are not met, we need a new formula. So we're going to do maximum likelihood for everything, but swap out which formula is the right way to calculate height to be consistent with what the data need. It's magic. Um, for those of you who are remembering uh, least squares type stuff from regression land, uh, a flavor of maximum likelihood known as residual maximum likelihood is exactly the same as least squares. It is the same thing. The difference with regular flavor maximum likelihood is that we are not taking into account degrees of freedom. So this is the version of the formulas that has n in the denominator rather than n minus k for the number of fixed effects. That's the difference between uh, regular flavor maximum likelihood, which is this, and the residual version. So it is all very much related. So given this multivariate normal distribution as our basis for height, and using that basis as a way to figure out which estimates are the most likely and thus judge the fit of the model, um, what do you do if it doesn't work? Well, if y is not really continuous, like if it's ordinal data, which is what a lot of people have and what I actually have, then we need a new different version of height. Um, rather than talk about that, I want to give you a workaround that can work in situations in which normal is not too implausible, and that's this idea of robust ML. So the the estimation of these models that we're going to use is robust ML, which is otherwise known as the, I'm going to go with Juan. Can anyone help me with that pronunciation? I know Bentler. I've actually met him, but the other person I haven't met, I don't think. Uh, their T2 statistic is corresponds to the MLR estimator in M+. And so this is still the same model. It is still a linear factor model where there is a linear slope that relates each item to the trait that predicts it. The R part stands for robust, and what it does is correct the fit statistics. So the indices of discrepancy between where the data are in terms of the covariance matrix and what our model says it should be, those indices get corrected for violations of multivariate normality and kurtosis in particular, and so do the standard errors. Um, on your reading list for this semester, there are three chapters from Craig Ender's Missing Data book on there. It's called Applied Missing Data Analysis or something like that. 
Um, the reason that it is on there, even though it's a book about missing data, is that it is the clearest depiction of this process that I've ever read. Like I read that chapter and I was like, oh my God, I finally understand this. It's a miracle. So I want you to have that same miracle experience. So it's chapter five sets up an explanation of MLR. And he goes through this idea that if the data are normal, there's some ratio of first derivatives to second derivatives that's supposed to hold. And if it doesn't hold, they use how far off it is as a way of correcting things for the deviations from normality. So after reading that, I felt like I sort of followed. Um, so what the robust does is it changes the standard errors, it changes the fit statistics, it does not change the model. It is still a linear model, and so it still predicts that your outcomes are supposed to be able to keep going forever and ever along that regression line. And if that's not true, we need a new model, not just a robust estimation approach. If you're in a situation where your model actually does fit, or let me go, oh my God. If you're in a situation in which your data actually do fit the assumptions, they're perfectly multivariate normal, that then this robust process simplifies to regular flavor ML. So there's no harm in using it. And as part of your output, what you will get is what's known as a scaling factor, where one means your data are perfectly multivariate normal, the outcomes that we're a factor analyzing. And in most cases, you'll see a scaling factor above one, which means that you have too much in the tails. Um, I had to write these words down because I never remember which is which. Leptokurtosis. There we go. And scaling factors under one, um, I've never actually seen. It's always over one. So you can think of that number that pops up roughly as an indicator of how far off you are from normality, where more is bad. And the scaling factor is going to be used in doing uh, comparisons of our height between our hypothesized model and the right answer model, which is the data, the saturated model. So we're using MLR. And that is why we're not using Stata. So Stata users, I'm sorry. I tried. I spent several hours seeing if I could find a way to do this. And the conclusion that I came to is that Stata does not have the capacity right now to allow both missing item responses and robust maximum likelihood estimation at the same time. MLR does both. Um, it was invented and it was implemented in M plus, I want to say like 2006-ish. It's been a long time, so I'm surprised Stata hasn't done this yet. So if anyone finds out that I'm wrong about this, please let me know out there in YouTube land or in this class, um, because I would like to have examples in Stata given that so many of you like that program. So for that reason, Stata's output would not match the examples that I'm giving in class because it's a different estimation given mis missing data. So I'm not using it. So there we go. Sorry about that. And model fits next. So let me pause since we're about out of time here. Questions. So next time, where we're headed then, is getting to know indices of model fit. How does the height of the predicted matrix that our model gives us, what the model says the item covariances should be, how does that height compare to the right answer? And there's going to be lots and lots of indices with fun acronyms to learn. Yay, so we'll get to that next time. Are you excited? Maybe or maybe you're just excited because it's 312 and you get to be done. Wahoo! Yes, I can be excited about that. Zoom is a, a tiring process at times. So thank you guys for hanging in there and being here with me. I appreciate it. It's a lot more fun to have you here than just talk to my computer. So uh, that's it then. Office hours start now. Let me know if you need anything. Do your formative assessment and I'll see you Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay, bye everybody. <laughs>